first principle that you can teach to people and it blows their mind because you get more aha moments from this principle than anything. This is the principle where I get the arm crossers to uncross their arms the most, which is great. Um, thank you, Katie, for muting people. I realize I could do that to other people too. I, I like that. Um, I'll try not to mute you. Um, but what I want to do first is um, go over the last four or the five steps in the smack recipe that we didn't finish with last week. Um, just real briefly, as we talked about, the smack recipe is sort of our secret formula to great workshops. And I went through the first five steps last week, and I just want to continue with the other ones. Um, before I do that, though, does anybody have any pressing questions to start off? Um, something that's on your mind, confusion, question, comment? At this part in the course, we're kind of halfway through here. So if anybody has any questions, I want to give you a second before I jump in. Rachel? <laughs> there we go. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. My yep. computer is sluggish. That's good. Um, at this point, should we be doing anything additional outside of these sessions um, to start to prepare for the date when we start presenting? The only thing, oh, that's a really good question, the only thing that I would suggest to any of you at any time is to, tr if there are any workshops in your area, to try to get out and see them. If you haven't seen a live workshop yet, um, that being said, it's a little bit tricky because July is our slowest, slowest month of the entire year, so there aren't a lot of workshops in your area, but anything you can do to get out and see a live workshop would be great. Other than that, not really. I mean, everything that I'm doing and, and giving you, um, if anybody wants more, feel free. I have tons of resources. I'm trying not to inundate you with lots of stuff, but for right now, I'm just trying to keep the pace. Um, just, and I can also, the other, only other thing is if any of you are interested and you haven't I like that. You guys can mute me, too. That's pretty impressive. Um, you can go to, uh, <laughs> if I get really boring, somebody just hit mute on me. That works for me. That's fine. Um, but you can, yeah, I can connect you with your local office if you're interested in meeting some PCA people in your local area. Because once you guys um, finish this course and you present your mock presentation to me on this video hangout, the next step would be to you get, for you to get in front of a live audience. And it will most likely be made up of people in your local chapter. So if you want to have any contact with them beforehand, that doesn't hurt either. But other than that, I think you're all, you're all on track. You're doing a good job. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. OK. All right, great. Okay, so jumping right in okay, here, so um, what I'd like to do first, and let me mute somebody, because somebody's echoing here. Um, the, the seventh step in the SMAC recipe is to make the book a lasting resource. And I wanted to just take a minute to talk about the book, because this book is something that, from a sales point of view, the partnership managers sell this book to the partners. And it is, it is a great revenue maker for PCA. Um, it's not cheap. It comes out, I think, when it's $12.95 to buy it itself. But I think the partners get a discount when they order a certain amount of it. I'm going to see who's echoing here. It's probably me. I can't. My okay. mute button won't come up on the screen anymore. All right. Let me see if I can mute you. I don't know if I just did or not. I muted Rachel. Yes, I did. Okay. So um, this, is a, this is a great resource for the people to have that are in your workshop. And I have had coaches come back to me later and say, this is my Bible. I keep this in my coaching bag. I go back to it all the time. I look up tools when a certain player is giving me a hard time. I look back in the chapter and say, oh, what can I do? And I always find great resources in this book. And it's a really easy read. So one of the things that I like to do as I go throughout the workshop is highlight the pages in the book where they'll find the same material. This used to be a workbook where the participants would fill in the blanks. Um, and we, done, we did away with that because that's not something that you throw in your coach's bag and look back to. But a book like this is very easy to hand off to people or to look back at or tag. I put sticky notes or you know dog ear pages, things like that. So one of the things that I really do want you guys to be comfortable with is if someone does have a question and it might be something that you're not familiar with or you're not that comfortable with, you can always point them to, oh, you know what, chapter four in the book has some great ideas for that. Or when you're doing the workshop, um, at the bottom of the slide, some of the principles and the tools have a page number that coincides with the book. So that's number seven, which is really important. Number eight, 
um, on the smack recipe is to hone your stories. Now this I always find interesting because the secret to a great workshop is that you use your stories to hit key PCA points in an impactful way in less than 60 seconds. Now I'm going to ask you to take that with a grain of salt because I think stories are one of the most powerful things that you can do, especially as a coach. When you can make these principles come alive to coaches by using examples from players that you've coached or players that you've seen coached, um, the effectiveness of a story is really in the storyteller. So I'm not going to say that you have to get it to 60 seconds. I'm going to throw my dog out the door. Hold on one second. Sorry. Come on. Go, go, go. Sorry, real professional, throwing my dog out the door. Um, okay, so, but anyway, I do think that, I don't want to put a time limit on your stories. However, if you have a fantastic story to illustrate a certain principle, practice it over and over and over again, and practice it in front of other people. Because there are certain times when I've heard trainers say, oh, I've got this great story to use, and the story ends up where they hit the wrong parts, and I'll say, you know, I love that story, but I wish you would have emphasized this instead. Um, sometimes the story coming in your head doesn't really translate as well. So just practice them. If you have a great story about another athlete or a player or a professional athlete or somebody that you've coached or you yourself when you were playing sports or if you are, um, I would say you know usually one to three minutes is max on a story. But that's, that's just personal preference. A lot of these principles, I would rather you tell a fantastic story to illustrate filling the emotional tank than reading the bullet points on the slide. And I think many people in the audience, when we do the evaluation at the end of the workshop, um, and one of the questions on the evaluation says the best part of this workshop was so many times people say the best part of the workshop was the stories that the presenter told because that's what they remember. So practice your stories. Um, number nine, we addressed already. Number nine says address the role of winning. I think I've gone over that multiple, multiple times that we are not soft, we are not easy and I think to get that right off the bat, that's the first criticism people have always had of Positive Coaching Alliance. You're all about positive, you're all about winning, you're all about everybody wins a trophy and to get that out of the way in the first couple minutes I think is crucial. Also, not only addressing the role of winning but addressing the role of the research that's behind our principles. That it's not just you standing up there saying, I think this is a better way to coach. I think you're going to win more games. This is proven methods from experienced coaches, yes, but it's backed up by research and studies, which is even more gives even more credibility to what you're saying. So that's why when a lot of trainers get up the first few times and they say, oh, I was so nervous. That's great to be nervous. But the cool thing is we've got your back, and there's a lot of studies behind what you're telling people that actually proven, proven methods and proven by sports psychologists that have spent way more time than any of us have proving these things. So it's, you're really just relaying information in a creative, engaging way. Um, number 10 is you know, self-explanatory again, end early with a honed finish. I always like to end five minutes early. Really important question to ask when you do a workshop before you get there. What time are the coaches, uh, how late are the coaches staying? What time did you tell them the workshop was over? Even if you have two hours on your paper that tells you the information is going to be presented and it's going to be done by nine o'clock, sometimes that changes and the person that you meet with might say, oh no, I told them it was done at 8.30. So know that ahead of time. Um, and especially getting there early, I can't tell you, there's been a few times when I've had to go through and hide, hide, slide, hide, slide, hide, slide when they've, I've thought I've had two hours and I said, oh no, you only have an hour and 25 minutes. So it doesn't happen often, but people like to leave when it's, on, uh, leave when you tell them to. And then the last one is send the sign-ins and the evaluations promptly to PCA. As I said, after the workshop at the end, um, the back of the book, there's an evaluation that everyone fills out. And we send them in to Positive Coaching Alliance. The text to sign in is already automatically sent to the office. And then the evaluations are sent as well by you. You put them in the mail. Um, I usually wait if you have a couple workshops coming up. I usually do, I send like one big envelope a month. But in the beginning, if you want to just send them right after your workshop so that you don't forget, you just put them in an envelope and Positive Coaching Alliance will reimburse you for postage and everything else. So that's pretty much the 11 steps to a wonderful workshop. Um, Questions on those before I get into the elm tree of mastery? Everybody's good. All right, awesome. Well then, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, at the end, hopefully today, we'll have some time. Uh, the call on Thursday, we had a few minutes for people to kind of share some stories and some parts that they liked and they wanted to do. Um, but I'm just going to jump right in. So we ended last week right here with the um, double goal coaching model. 
and this is where we're going to start today. So usually I, I'm really big on transitions. I like one sort of area of the workshop to flow into the next. So I consider this the introduction to the workshop uh, where you've just gone over the goal. You know, double goal coach is a term that a lot of people haven't heard before. Um, and the goals are striving to win, but also teaching life lessons. And we had just mentioned 10 or 12 of those life lessons. Now, when this slide finishes, I usually, before I go to this slide here, I say, okay, now this is fantastic. If all of you could go home and just change the way you coach so that teaching the life lessons is more important than striving to win, or they blend together seamlessly, that's our goal. But what happens when the coaches have the right idea? You've all walk, you're all going to walk out of this workshop, you're going to be fired up, you're going to have your book under your arm, and you're going to be ready to be the best double goal coach there is. But unfortunately, you're not the only people in the equation. Who else is involved in this drama of youth sports? If we're really going to change a culture, we've got a lot of balls in the air here. Who can tell me who else is involved in the drama of youth sports? Parents. Parents, yes. Parents play a key role in their children's youth sports experience. And I'm sure all of you have had nothing but wonderful experiences with the parents on the sidelines at your games. I know for me, it's just been a pleasure. And that's why the number one, uh, number one coaching, coveted coaching position in the country right now is the Little League Orphans League, which I, I heard about a year ago. And I thought, that's just, that would just be a great job, the Little League Orphans. All right, so we've got parents. Who else do we have involved in the drama? Athletic directors. Sure, athletic directors, board presidents of the Little League board, the Soccer Coaches Association. Yes, we've got the leaders. Now, the leaders have a big job as well. We're going to talk about that in a second. So we've got the parents, we've got the coaches, we've got the leaders. And who plays probably the most crucial role? The athletes. The athletes themselves, exactly. So... One of the things that we have coined as a phrase, and we've actually got a patent on it, is called the development zone. And this is, again, is a new term a lot of people haven't heard from. We've got an industry in sports. And all of you know, any of you that played sports as a young child probably have had many, many times now coming back as a coach saying, wow, sports are a lot different than they were when I was a kid. And one of the reasons is because the sports, the youth sports industry has sort of taken on the role of the entertainment sports industry. And there's a big difference between entertainment industry of sports and the youth model of sports. We call the youth the development zone. And there's a reason why. Because in the development zone, we've got a certain role that we would like the leaders and the coaches and the parents and the athletes to play. Here's the perfect world of the development zone. We would like the leaders to shape this culture that we're trying to create. You know as double goal coaches, your role is to strive to win but also to teach life lessons that are going to stay with the kids long after they hang up their athletic shoes and their, and their ball. Um, now, parents. This is one of the ones I love. Parents are called second goal parents. Now, if you're a double goal coach and your first goal is to win, your second goal is to teach life lessons, let's say for the parents, guess what, parents? You don't have to deal with, now remember, what this is so funny. I saw, a, a, this is just between you and I, and I thought this was hilarious, and I probably shouldn't record this. But I saw a trainer do this one day, and he was like, yes. There are two goals, winning and teaching life lessons. Parents, we don't want you to worry about the first goal. And I lost it. I thought it was hilarious. So I had to share that with you because I thought that was so funny. But don't want to do that at a workshop. Yes, the second goal of the parent is to help the kids focus on the life lessons, not worry about winning. Could you imagine having all of the parents on the sidelines at your games just focus on supporting you as a coach and teaching the kids the life lessons? Wow, that would be awesome. So that's what our goal is for the parents. Let the coaches worry about the winning. You deal with supporting them. And then the last one, the other group that we really focus on a lot, mostly at the high school age, but we are getting younger and younger in our years, is the triple impact competitor, athletes. And with the athletes, their focus is to work on the word better, constantly striving for better. Better self, bettering of their teammates, and bettering of the game. And that's one of my favorite workshops to do also. So what I want you to think about, coaches, is this. We call this a development zone. Well, what does that mean? Well, I want you to think about the kids and the athletes that are playing on your team. They're still in development, which is a huge difference than athletes that are in the professional industry. What would you say are, let's say if you can turn to a partner right now, and this is what I'd have you do. You guys can't really turn to a partner. But I would have you turn to a partner, and I want you to tell your partner three differences between the entertainment sports industry and the development zone youth sports industry. Okay, so go ahead. Turn to a partner. Can I just have a couple of you just call out what are what are some of the main differences between entertainment industry of sports and youth sports? Money. Money, exactly. Money is a motivator. Absolutely. What's another one? 
How about the role of any of these people? It, let's say, what's the role of, of coaches in the entertainment sports industry? What's the role of the athletes? What's the role of the managers and owners versus youth sports? Give me some differences. Uh, usually the role of the coaches is really just to win. I mean, we see all the time coaches don't win and they get fired pretty soon after. So Exactly. So for job security, they have to win. So their focus needs to be on winning, absolutely. So winning and money are the focus. Now, if winning and money are the main focus, how does that trickle down to the behavior of the athletes? When you have money and your job on the line and you're leading the athletes, how does that, how does that trickle down? Win at all costs because that's how they get paid. Sure, absolutely, because it's their job. Now, have any of you, all I want to see is a, a shake of a head yes or a shake of a head no. Have any of you ever seen those type of behaviors trickle down on your youth sports experience? Yeah, because some parents forget that, and coaches forget, that they're in development. If I were to say to all of you sitting here right now that I'm going to hand all of you the hot off the presses right out of the factory, the new iPhone 7. It's not even out yet, but it's in development. So I'm going to give these to you for free. You're going to have it for six weeks. It's a product in development. You're going to be able to play with it, use it, however you want to use it, completely for free. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. In six weeks, I'm going to ask you to come back and give me your evaluation of how you think this iPhone 7 works. Now, here's my question for you. Let's say you take it home, and for the first three weeks, it works great, no glitches at all. Come around week four, it crashes on you often. Would you expect that from a product that's in development? Yeah. Would you expect it to do some pretty cool things? Yeah, probably. Would you be disappointed if I handed you something for free and I said it's still in development, it's just a prototype, it's not quite perfect yet? Would you expect it to be the most incredible piece of technology you've ever had? No. Because when things are in development, we know they're not quite finished yet. Think about the kids you're coaching. They're in development. They're not quite finished. They do some really cool things. They crash and burn sometimes. And that's our job as coaches, to bring out the skills that they're having. They're not in the entertainment industry. They're not professionals yet. So we as coaches have to remember that the attitude that we have is going to translate also to the parents and to the athletes. So let's take a look at two different styles of coaching. Okay, I'm going to show you a clip from a movie called We Are Marshall. And all I want you to do when you look at this clip is I want you to think about what is this coach's ultimate focus. And I don't know if I can get this to play for you. Hopefully I can. Yes. Good effort out there today. Let me be clear about this. A good effort is not enough. And I'm proud of it. And I will not accept losing with you. Because there's only one thing they judge us on. There's only one thing people remember. And it ain't how we play the game. Winning is everything. Somebody describe for me, what is that coach's focus? Yeah, it's a big W. <laughs> Winning is everything, absolutely. This is what we call a scoreboard-focused coach. And... There are many, many different types of coaches in the world, but we've done a lot of studies, and Joan Duda, especially from University of Birmingham, England, studied a lot of these coaches and found that coaches fall into two different categories. We've got the scoreboard-focused coach. Anybody ever play for a coach like this? I mean, this guy looked familiar to some of you? Yeah, absolutely. Because this is the culture that we're in. This is what society says today. Winning is important. I call it the McDonald's theory. The first time I started coaching, I had six-year-olds, and our very first game, I decided I was going to be the coolest coach ever, and there was actually a Rita's Water Ice down the street. For those of you that don't know, Rita's is like the best water ice ever on the East Coast. Um, so I took my team to Rita's, and I bought them all water ice. And as soon as we got there, there was a whole bunch of people waiting in line. And the very first question that they asked all my little six-year-olds in uniform was what? Did you win? Right. Did you win? And, of course, at six years old, the kids were like, yeah, yeah, we won. It was great. It was awesome. We didn't keep score then. But they all said, yeah, yeah, we won. It was great. Now, the neat thing is, is that it doesn't matter how old you are. I've taken my own daughters in their high school uniforms out to wherever, McDonald's, or to go get dinner, or to go get pizza. And as soon as they see people in uniform, the very first question is, did you win? And if you say yes, then it's all great. You're wonderful. If you say, oh, no, I didn't win, the next question is, what do you want on your pizza? Because everybody kind of dismisses you. 
So this is built into our society, built into our culture. We have three principles that we're going to talk about today. The first one's called the Elm Tree of Mastery. And that principle we're going to talk about redefining success, redefining what winning actually means, and how do you motivate your players to work at their best level of performance. The second one is called filling the emotional tank. Filling the emotional tank is what makes your athletes teachable. What will enable them to listen to you? All the work and sweat and blood and tears you put into your practice plans, and sometimes you sound like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 and the kids are not even listening. So we want to get them in a state of mind where they are sponges, and they're listening to everything you say, and they're able to accept criticism and work really hard. The last one's called honoring the game, and this is the third principle that when you work with these three together, honoring the game is the one that will stick with them. Honoring the game shows them that this game they're playing is that, is that, what, that's exactly what it is. It's just a game, but it's bigger than themselves. And this is where the life lessons really hit the pavement because there are decisions that kids have to make, game time decisions that might go against what society is telling them to do. And the culture that you make on your team, those make the best decisions. The three principles we're talking about. All right, so let me show you a clip. Now, this, let me show you, tell you guys, this is an optional slide. I mentioned the, oh, where is it? Here it is. Why is it not flipping? Am I frozen for everybody here? Okay, sorry. Sorry. Can anybody, am I frozen? I look frozen here. Can you guys see me? Am I good? Okay. This slide we put in is optional. Um, we used to hit this pretty hard, but because the study was from the university, of, or I'm sorry, from the year 2000, it's a little bit outdated. So I like to mention this study, as I just did real quick, about Dr. Joan Duda doing this study at University of Birmingham, England. But um, a study that's 15 years old doesn't really have a ton of validity right now. So I say this is optional. If you can find a way to use it, do it. I like to mention it. Sometimes I'll put it up if I have time. It is a great study to show that the mastery coaches actually won more medals at the Olympics than the other coaches. I mention this study throughout the workshops I do. But as I said, I don't harp real hard on the fact that it was from the 2000 Olympics because people are like, that was so old. Is that still true? Although it does still hold true. But that's an optional slide. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this. I'm going to show you the next slide. The next video I'm going to show you is from the same movie, We Are Marshall. And if any of you are familiar with the story, unfortunately, the coach that you saw in the beginning and his team perished in a tragic airplane accident. So this new coach, Jack Lengel, had to take over and build a team from the ground up, and they didn't have a whole lot of talent. They didn't have a whole lot of natural skills. He was pulling, literally pulling guys off the dorms that had ever touched a football before and said, hey, come on my team because I want to rebuild this team. So if you have a team like the first coach that has a pretty successful record, winning is a fantastic motivator. But what do you do when your team does not have the W's behind? They don't have the scoreboard on their side. How do you motivate them? I'm going to show you a different type of coaching style. And this one I know is not going to play because I just tried to play it right before I walked in the door. So hopefully all of you have seen that. I'd have to download it to get it to play right now. I just realized right before the call it didn't play. But those of you that have seen it, um, he's telling the men that he is, um, you know, they're going to be behind on the scoreboard. It doesn't matter. They have to lay their heart on the line. He says, you know, he just inspires them. Their faces are inspired. They're ready to go out there and play. And he wants them to play with their heart. He does talk about, you know, your opponents are bigger, faster, stronger. They're just better. But what they don't know is your heart. They don't know how hard you work and how hard you play. So after this clip, I asked them, okay, what's the difference in these two different coaches? We've had the first one that had the scoreboard definition of success. And then we had the second one that was really not focusing on the win. He was focusing on how they played, which we call the mastery definition. What would you say is the biggest difference in those two? And this, again, I would have them turn to a partner. I wouldn't just have them call out loud because this is sort of a uh, discussion question. But if one of you guys wouldn't mind sharing with me, what do you think is the biggest difference between these two styles of coaching? I think the biggest difference would be results versus effort. So exactly. scoreboard is results and mastery is effort. Good. So scoreboard is results, mastery is effort. Now, would you say that first coach, Rachel, I'm gonna, um, if you don't mind, would you say that first coach was focusing on their effort as well? I think he was, but the focus of the effort was more along the lines of the results, like of, of winning at that point. So I think, I think he had to understand it's going to take effort, but effort to win. So it was, a little bit, it was a little bit of a different approach, I think, than direct focus on effort. Good, exactly. And you know what I find interesting, too? I don't know how many of you have ever been in this situation, but I would bet that if their team did not put out their best effort but still won the game, how many of you would say 
that that coach in the very beginning would still be pleased. Yeah. So if you're a scoreboard focused coach, if your definition of success is a win on the scoreboard, you're actually not expecting the greatest effort from your athletes as long as you win. I know for me, for my sake, when I'm giving, when my team is giving the best effort, that's when I think they're going to win. And what I wanted you to see was that giving effort, and Rachel was exactly right, focusing on the results was the first one, focusing on effort. When you give your best effort, I don't care if your team has an undefeated record or they have a complete losing record. Giving the best effort is going to get the best performance out of your athletes, no matter who you are, individually. That is focusing on mastery. The scoreboard definition is where that coach is going to compare his team to other teams. And the second coach did that as well. The second coach said the other team is better, stronger, and faster. However, he went one step further. Mastery definition coaches and the idea of success and winning is how much can you learn? How much are you going to learn from those other players? I have been up against, especially in basketball, I remember, as a young sophomore playing on varsity, I was up against girls that were six inches taller than me. They were better players than I was. And I got better in that game just because I was able to play against them. Instead of getting defeated that the girl was going left and shooting, you know, faking left and going right every time and blowing by me, my coach set it up that she didn't take me off that girl because she saw that I was improving every single time. So what a great coach I had to be able to turn that around to me and make it a learning opportunity. And the last one, scoreboard definition coaches make it very clear that it is not okay to make a mistake. And mastery definition coaches say, mistakes are okay. Now, let me just ask you this quick question, just a visual question right now. If you were a scoreboard definition coach and I just went for an open shot on goal in soccer, I had the whole field to myself, my defender was 10 feet behind me, I took a beautiful shot and it went right over the top of the net. And I turned around and I missed and I turned around and looked at you and you were the fans in the stands. I want you to show me just by a visual, what would you be doing to show me that it is not okay that I just made a mistake? Ready? One, two, three, show me. Absolutely. Another amazing study I heard was that visual stick with a kid 10 times longer than what comes out of your mouth coaches. So I want you to remember that. Kids remember what they see. So even for that split second when they've made a mistake and they turn around and you're doing one of these or you're throwing your clipboard or you're just even if you're just trying to keep it in, that's what they see and you've showed them that it's not okay to make mistakes. John Wooden was one of the greatest basketball coaches ever. And one of his, he had many, many quips and mottos, but one of the mottos he said was the team that makes the most mistakes wins. How is that possible? How can a team that makes the most mistakes win? Somebody volunteer for me and help us out. They play fearlessly. Good. They play fearlessly. Absolutely. What else do they do? What else are they not afraid to do? They're not afraid to make those mistakes, so they take chances and they grow as players and get better. Yeah, think about that. I have so many kids on my team. I coach lacrosse, and I have little guys, and they all want to just cradle with their right hand, cradle with their right hand, because they're so comfortable, and I'm trying to teach them to go left. Go with your left hand. It's, it's new. It might feel weird for you. And they all say, Coach, I'm afraid I'm going to drop it. They're afraid. So we take that fear out of them, and I now reward them. Every time somebody on my team switches hands, I have a starburst that I keep, I have a bag of starbursts I keep in my bag and I keep track of how many times they switch hands and I give them that many starbursts at the end of the half just to say, wow, who gets the starburst or because you're a star because you took that risk. So I'm trying to encourage the kids to take as many mistakes as they can. So if you look at these two definitions, research has shown, I don't know how many of you have sports psychologists on your staff, not many of us do. So we're going to help you out here and we're going to give you the research behind this. Sports psychology research by many, many professors, one of the ones that we used was a study by Robert Rosser at Stanford University. And this is a non-controversial study that shows that the mastery approach to coaching and the mastery approach in your culture of playing has actually proven to give more results on the scoreboard. So the performance of the athletes improves. Effort, learning, and mistakes are okay. We call it the elm tree of mastery. Why is that? Well, anxiety goes down and self-confidence goes up. Why would that happen? Because what does this mastery approach give you a feeling of? Okay, one, two, three, I'm going to ask you to call out a word. What does this give you a feeling of? One, two, three, go. And everybody calls out. Whatever word they call out, somebody usually says control. I had a field hockey coach in high school that would say control what you can control. That was her biggest word, control what you can control. And if you really think about your life, when you are in control, things make more sense. When you're focusing on whatever else is going on out there, you lose control. Your anxiety is going to go up. You're going to be nervous. So the best way to bring down anxiety of your athletes is to focus them on what they can control. All right. 
that the study also proven that they were going to work harder, they're going to stick to it longer. Now, let's put this into practice, coaches. Here's a scenario. Jesse hangs his head every time he misses a shot, and as a result, he doesn't get back on defense. What can you do? Now, at this point, trainer to trainer, um, I've been talking a lot. Remember at the introduction, I had the coaches up, and they were moving around, and they were talking back and forth, and they were sharing ideas. So for the first part of the Elm Tree of Mastery, everybody's in their seats. And I have them sometimes turn to a partner and talk, sometimes call out. So I'm still not just lecturing. But at this point is where I want them up and out of their seats and engaged and talking. So depending on who your audience is, if you have um, mixed coaches, let's say you're coaching, you're doing a workshop for a certain athletic league and you have all different types of sports, at this point I will have them split up by sport. And one of the fun ways that I've had them do it before is I'd say, okay, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to stand up and I'm going to ask you to pantomime the sport that you play. And what you're going to do is you're going to put yourself into groups according to what sport you play. And this is really funny to see a bunch of adults like shooting baskets or dribbling or trying to dribble a soccer, an imaginary soccer ball around. And I'll say, okay, I'll give you two minutes to get into a group according to what sport you coach and just by looking around at each other and seeing what sport it is. So that's if you have a group that you can read that they're going to be really into this. I wouldn't try to pull this on a bunch of old fart coaches that have no interest in doing this at all. If that's the case and you can read that sort of through your first 10 minutes of the workshop, then what I do is I have them, I'll say, okay, I'd like all the soccer coaches over here, baseball over there, you know, whatever it is. Now, if you do a workshop, which we do very often, where it's one sport but different age levels, I will break them up into groups according to their age level that they coach. So I'll say, okay, if you're coaching eight and unders, I'd like you to get in a group over here, 10 and unders here, 11, you know, 12 and unders here, 15 and overs or whatever here. Now, why do you think it's really important for a scenario to have them grouped either by sport or by age level? Why do you think that's, I've seen that be really effective? Go ahead, Rachel. I was just saying so they can relate to what's, you know, what the scenario. Yeah. We're on the same page. Yeah, and it's it, that, that's exactly what. And and I've done this be like when I first started, I was like, oh, get with three people, you know, mix up with anybody that you want to. And I realized when you have an eight and under coach trying to explain this type of a scenario with a somebody that's coaching fifteen year olds, it just doesn't translate. The other thing that I really liked about it is that the kids that are are the kids, the the coaches that are coaching the younger kids can get a different perspective from the coaches that are coaching the older kids. So it usually ends up being about four or five groups. I'll give them two minutes to talk about, you're a coach, what do you do with a kid like this? And translate it also into your sport. Because obviously we have misses a shot. Well, if you're a swim coach, you're not going to have a shot to miss. So I say, you know, translate it however you can to your sport. You know what I'm talking about, a child that just beats themselves up and is really hard on themselves when they miss a shot, so much so that they're not ready for the next play. So then I will ask, um, I'll ask them to pick a spokesperson, and whenever I have people break up into groups, I always walk around to the groups because I love to hear what they're saying. It might not be what they share with the whole group, but I love to see how they're doing. I like to see if they're on task. Are they paying attention? How much, do they need more time? Do they need less time? And so what I'll do is sometimes I'll say, okay, pick a spokesman from your group, and I'm going to ask you to share the best answer that the group came up with. Or I'll say, you know, decide whose birthday is closest to today, or whoever has the most kids. Or who, you know, whoever's been coaching the shortest is going to share the whatever whatever you know description you want to do to get for somebody to share because it's amazing to me even with adults they will leave you hanging you'll say okay can I get somebody to share and you'll hear crickets so whatever you can do to force somebody to as soon as you say oh can somebody whose birthday is closest to today then they're like oh, oh that's me I'll share it's really funny works with eight year olds too but it works with adults very effectively um, all right so. Let me just pretend you guys have spoken. Um, I'm just going to get one of you to just volunteer your answer. Jesse hangs his head when he misses a shot, doesn't get back on defense. Coach, what would you do to help a kid like Jesse? Can I have one of you, um, somebody I haven't heard from yet, can I have someone share with me what they would do? I'll See share, Kelly. There. Thank you, Laura. Um, I think it's important to reward the effort obviously as soon as they miss the shot so um, you know definitely saying you know hey it was a great effort you know you'll get it next time so giving them immediate feedback positive feedback um, and then give them what they need to do next so that they could forget it quickly good Good, I like that. So you reward the effort right away as soon as they come out. That was a good job. And then tell them what they need to do next. I love that idea. 
Would somebody else like to add to what Laura's saying? Maybe you would definitely reward the effort as well, but maybe you have one more step that you would add to that. Rachel, go ahead. Sorry, I always Danielle, like to make a point that I always like to make a point that uh, there's always another opportunity. So even if you know you're close to the end of the game, it's you know push hard, see if you can get another shot. Or you know, for me, it's it's softball. So you know that's why you get three strikes. Um, you'll always get another at bat. So think about what didn't work with this one, and then go you know get pumped to to go attack the next one. Mm -hmm. Great job. All right, that's a great idea as well. One more person, and I'll, so I'll get like a couple different people to share. Owen, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Keep going. That's okay. No, no, no. Go ahead. I just think it depends what you want to emphasize. Um, mm -hmm. It may be that you want to emphasize the fact that the kid needs to get back on defense. So either you can cite someone else who is doing that or just say, listen, Jesse, I don't care if you make it or not. That's no big deal. What we're really looking for is the defense. And the next time he gets back on defense, then praise that. And then the emphasis is clear in his or her mind. Great. Yeah, that's a very good point as well. What I want you to think of as coaches also is where is your focus? And the way that you respond to somebody like Jesse will really tell you pretty clearly where your focus is. As, as Owen said, his focus is I want you to get back on defense. So getting back on defense, is that an outcome? Is that a scoreboard focus or is that a mastery or skill focus? How many of you would say that's an outcome scoreboard focus? How many of you would say that's a mastery or a skill? Right, so if you have a mastery or a skill, the skill is I want you to get back on defense. But what's your athlete focusing on if he's beating himself up at the mistake? Okay, I know you guys are muted. It's hard for you to call out. But in a workshop, I'd be more conversational here. But yeah, so the, so the coaches usually say something like, yeah, he's beating himself up because he made a mistake. So the athlete's focus is on winning and the scoreboard. You as a coach, can you hold that kid accountable? You know what, Jesse? I want you to get back on defense. Are you able to get back on? Can you hustle back on defense? Yeah, keep that kid accountable for what he needs to do. I've heard so many coaches that think they're doing the wonderful positive thing by saying, it's okay, Jesse, you'll get him next time. Great job. And I'm going to tell you right now that great job are probably two of the most useless words that can ever come out of a coach's mouth because there is absolutely no critical information in good job. If you want to praise an athlete for what he did. Let's say, let's say this was um, ice hockey, okay? And Jesse missed a shot. What was? What are two things Jesse did well? Tell me, coaches. What are two great things? Instead of saying good job, be specific. What did Jesse do? He was aggressive. He took the shot. Sure, he was aggressive. He took the shot. He probably beat his defender to get possession of the puck. Maybe he had a great angle. Maybe he had awesome follow through. Be specific with Jesse. That's where we're talking about mastering the skill. So that's what you're focusing on as praise because I don't care how Jesse played. If he missed a shot and you as a coach say, good job, Jesse, good effort, Jesse, which is good too, Jesse's thinking, no, I didn't. I messed up. But if you tell Jesse specifically what he did well, that will stick with him. Then you say, okay, Jesse, but my expectation on this team is the 100% effort, what Jesse is in control of, is getting back on defense. So yeah, make them hold the line on that. So coaches, what I want you to remember is the scoreboard focus and the mastery focus, we're not saying forget the scoreboard because it's important. The scoreboard is a very important measure of success. It's the measure that we put on games. That's why we do it. But there is a very important balance of the two. That second video that you guys didn't see, but the second video I always bring up, that he did compare his team to others, yet... When comparing him to others, he was also talking about the heart and the effort that they do have control over. So that's really um, the toolkit on page. And this is where I'll have everybody. Okay, open up to page 23. I'm going to show you. Chapter 4 has some awesome ways to get kids and your team to focus on mastery. And Chapter 4 begins a little bit sooner. Chapter 4 begins on page 21. But if you look on page 23, there's a tool called the Mistake Ritual. We're going to have you walk out of here with a whole kit of tools that you're going to have in your coach's bag that you're going to be able to use and put into practice with your athletes immediately walking out of here. And that's what I loved so much when I came to a Positive Coaching Alliance workshop. I walked out of there with all these ideas that I could use literally the next day on the field. So one of the things that we talk about is called the Mistake Ritual. And we've borrowed that term from many, many different players, but one of the things we took it from was Mike Lagarza in Redwood, California shared this with us, and he uses the flush. So what I'm going to ask all of you to do right now is put your arm up in the air as high as you can. And on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to make a flushing toilet sound as loud as possible. One, two, three. 
and I have adults do this and they all crack up and I always say, yeah, you're laughing, you think it's funny, imagine a bunch of eight-year-old boys on your little league team. They think it's hilarious. Flushing something, a mistake ritual, is a physical sign that signals a mental reset. And when a kid can get a physical mistake out of his mind by a flush, brush it off, shake it off, um, I have girls teams, they always have a ponytail around their wrist, they snap it, whatever it is, or even sometimes just saying the words next play. They're ready, they're engaged, that's my expectation, that when the play comes down again, you're ready. Is it okay to hold kids accountable? Can you as a coach be tough on Jesse for missing a shot? That's not going to help him. But can you be tough on Jesse and hold him accountable to getting back on defense? Absolutely. That's why we're not talking about being soft. Positive does not mean happy-go-lucky unicorns and rainbows all the time. We mean hold your athletes accountable for their effort and your expectations of them. Another one, and this is, again, I usually pick two. That's why I'm in the assignment this week. I asked you to take two. I take the time, even though it's not on the slide. This is where I like to tell a story, if you have one. Um, I always share, 100% of the time, I share with my athletes, my coaches' effort goals because effort goals is something that changed my way of coaching. I did a lot of goal setting when I coached high school and even when I coached college, even when I coached high school lacrosse, we always set goals. But what I realized, if you open up page 25 in your book, I was setting the wrong goals. I was having my team set outcome goals. So if you look at the top of page 25, I'm going to show you a difference that made a huge, huge impact on my coaching. For example, in baseball or softball, the outcome goal that a coach might have is, I want you to beat the throw to first base. Or in basketball, I want you to get the rebound. Or in lacrosse, I want you to get possession of the ball. All of these things are goals that we want to happen for success on the field, and that's all well and good. However, do the athletes have 100% control of those things? So for example, in basketball, if I said, okay, next time out, guys, second half, we're going to gain control of every rebound. And the players go out, and they get crushed on the boards the very first time. All of a sudden, they've made a mistake and they're a failure because every single player cannot get a rebound. So it's kind of an unattainable goal. However, what do you have to do? I know a lot of you guys coach basketball and play basketball. What do you have to do to be in position to get a good rebound? Box out. Box out, right. So to be, and, and I would actually, when I share this at my workshops, I have somebody come up and show me, and I teach them, even if they're not a basketball coach, I teach them, all right, if you're going to get the rebound, and I show them how to box out, and I show them how to keep their arms wide, and I always make a joke that put your butt out, you know, whatever you need to do to box out to take up this big space. Can every single person, and what I've done too, which is fun, is if the, if the crowd is right, I'll get a little tiny female coach, and I'll get the biggest guy I can find. And I'll say, can you two come up here? And I'll have this little tiny five foot one, now it doesn't have to be female, but usually I just pick a tiny little girl or little woman. She'll be in position to box out against this big guy if they're in the room together. And I'll say, okay, can she box him out? And, and they'll all be like, uh, you know, can she, will she most likely get the rebound? No, she probably won't. But can she box out? Yes, she absolutely can. That's an effort goal. If she boxes out every single time that ball goes up in the air, will she be more likely to get a rebound? Yes. Will she always have a six foot four guy on her back? No. So at some point, she's going to get the rebound because she's in the right position. So that's an effort goal. Is she in control of it, and can everybody on your team do it? So coaches, what I'm going to ask you to do is think of an effort, think of an outcome goal that you want your team to do, because that's the easiest to think about. I want, to, I want them to score more goals. I want them to get back on defense. I want them to sprint to the end. I want them to be fast into their flip turn, uh, whatever it is. And then I want you to think to yourself, can everybody do that, and what skill do they have to improve to be able to reach that goal? Those are the effort goals. So what I did with my lacrosse team just this year, I decided to get the parents involved. And I gave each of my girls before every game an index card. And it had the effort goal for that game on it. And so the very top of the card, it would have the girl's name. And then the girls would write down. I had, they all had a pen in their bag. And they'd write down the effort goal was, I'm gonna, you're going to hustle to every ground ball. So you're going to sprint every time there's a ground ball in lacrosse. And then right before the game, when we all come in and we're kind of doing our coaches talk, I would have these 12-year-old girls run out to their parents and hand them the card and say, Mom, Dad, here's the effort goal of the day. Can you keep track? Every time I hustle to a ground ball, just put a little tally mark. And they loved it. The parents were focused then on the goal, the effort goal. The parents weren't focusing on winning because I had so many parents that I'd hear them huff and puff and groan from the sidelines when their 12-year-old dropped a ball. And I was like, you know what? Your 12-year-old's sprinting to get open for the ball. If she catches it, it's a miracle. Don't be upset with her when she misses it. 
So I had the parents focusing on the effort goal. And then at halftime, when I brought the girls in, before they even came to me, they'd run to their parents and get the I said, go get your cards, go get your cards. And they'd run to the sidelines, get the card from their parents or grandmother, whoever was watching. And they just did positive charting for me, which is another tool that you can read about in the book. They took care of seeing, and they would hand me the cards, and I'd say, how many times, how many times did you run for the ball? And she'd say, four. How many times did you do it? Two. How many times did you do it? One. And they did all the work for me. And these girls were excited, and they were fired up. And sometimes I'd say, okay, you got four, you know, you hustled the four ground balls in the first half. Go run back to your parents. Let them keep track next time. And it was just, it was just such a wonderful way for the parents to get focused, the kids to get excited, their parents to get involved. And I've never before in a season of coaching eight years of lacrosse have had parents so excited about cheering for their daughters to hustle to a ground ball. They didn't even care if they got it. It was, go, sprint, you got it, good job, even if they dropped the ball left and right. So that's a story that I always share because it really it made a huge difference this year. All right, and then we go into the next principle, so I'm going to stop there. We still have 12 minutes left. That is awesome. All right, here's the time. We've got 12 minutes left, and I would like to know, I know there's a lot of you on here, and you all don't have to share, but if any of you have any thoughts, comments, feedback, or, you know, do you think this story would work, or this is what I would do, or questions about grouping, or ideas, this is free, open forum for the next 12 minutes just on Elm Tree of Mastery. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go down the line, and if you have a question, yes. If not, you can just say, nope, I'm good, and we'll go on to the next person. So I want to give everyone an opportunity if you have something. Alonzo, did you have any questions or comments? Nope, you're good. Ace? Uh, I think I'm all set. Okay, Chad? Uh, no, I'm good, thanks. Okay, Danny? All right, Jim? We still can't hear Jim. All right, we'll come back to you, Jim. Katie, you good? Questions, comments? I'm good. I just want to do a little bit of a plug here. Um, I actually am controlling the PCA Facebook account right now. I work for the marketing department, for those who don't know. And I just posted something on um, a mistake ritual on our Facebook, and we have like 100 people looking at it right now in the PCA Development Zone. So if, awesome. you, uh, if, you, if you don't follow us on Facebook, you should, because we post really cool resources about um, all of our principles. Nice. And if you haven't put in, actually write this down, Katie. Give them the Development Zone website so they can check that out too and bookmark that. Yeah, it's pcadevzone.org. I'm typing it into the search into the group chat right now. There it is. Um, and that it will take you to a collection of all of our resources. We have videos, articles, worksheets, book excerpts. A lot of the book excerpts that you will be reading and sharing at the workshops are in the development zone. Um, we have over a thousand resources in there, and you can actually search by principle. So after this, if you want to enhance your learning, you can go and click on the PCA principle mistakes, mistake ritual, Elm. Um, we have another one for Mastery Approach just for Elm. And so uh, you can go and read about all the resources we have that cover this topic. Awesome. So, Rachel, there's a good question, too. You know, should we be doing more? Checking out the Development Zone Resource Center and our website, that's, that's a, I forgot all about that. That's a great thing to do. And so there's the Facebook page is just Positive Coaching Alliance. There is also a Facebook page for the trainers. So you guys are welcome to um, to get on that as well, join that group, because even though you're not trainers yet, it's got specific trainer questions about, you know, in a workshop, this happened, how should I handle it, what should I do from a trainer point of view. So if you guys are on Facebook, that's a great thing to do as well. And they can also um, they can follow us on Twitter as well, too. If you want to get, you know, if you guys are on Twitter a lot, you can uh, follow us on that as well. So thanks, Katie, for mentioning that. I appreciate it. There you go. A positive coach US. Nice. Kelly, what is the how do we find the trainer group on Facebook? Is it Positive Coaching Alliance Trainers or is it I think it's PCA Trainers. Do you know off the top of your head, Katie? I think you have to be invited. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe you do. I assume Sonia will invite everybody once they become officially certified. Okay. I wasn't sure if you could just search it. I, I can't tell because when I search it, it comes up because I because <laughs> I'm invited. Yeah, they she has to invite you because they share like HR documents and stuff on there, so they don't want they want people who are certified to be on it. Okay, so I lied. You cannot be on it, but you can join the other Facebook page, and then hope that someday you can be on the other the other one. All right, <laughs> thanks. All right, Laura, comments, questions. Uh, the only question I have is, um, so obviously my background is soccer. We all kind of have different backgrounds. If you're speaking to 
a group from a different sport, do you tailor your stories to try to, um, for them to like understand them? Like, do you try to fix them so that they're more relatable for their sport, or do you kind of speak from your experience? I personally speak from my experience. Uh, if I'm going to tell a story about another sport, I would say like, oh, you know, and I and I, I ask people all the time that are coaching other sports I didn't play, like, how would you do this or how would you use this or do you use a mistake ritual? How do you use a mistake ritual in the pool? You know, things like that. Um, but if it's something that's easily relatable, like field hockey and soccer, can it's the same type of a sport. Or I do a lot of analogies bet between like individual sports like swimming or track or, you know, something like that. Is different than more of a team sport, um, but I don't try to say like, oh, and this would work in volleyball too, unless I know for a fact it would, and I've seen it used. So I think that's where I always say like, try to get as many ideas as you can when you go on, even on the the things that are posted in this course, and you see sport specific examples. I mean, feel free to use those. You know, I you know any of you, you're all friends, you're all coworkers, whatever. You know, I, I know a guy that uses, well, I think, what was it, Jim that posted, like, Gatorade winner of the game or the, the Gatorade guy or whatever it was, and I thought that was so cool. And I'm like, there's a good example to share. Um, we, we, I think I told you the guys this before, but somebody said, yeah, we're in the business of R&D, and somebody said, oh, research and development, and I said, no, rip off and duplicate what everybody does. That's, that's your role. You can do that. So feel free to use stories from other trainers. No one ever has a problem with it. That's why next week we're going to be out in um, California and we do a Trainers Institute, and that's really the whole intent of the four days out there is to share stories, share ideas, and we're just constantly like jotting down, like, oh my gosh, that's an awesome idea. I love that. I want to try that. You know, it's kind of like free reign because we're not really in competition with each other. Um, so that's, that's my suggestion. Okay. Thank yep. You. Yep. Lindsay, did you have anything? Uh, no, I'm okay, thanks. Okay. Owen? Um, I've got a bunch of questions, but maybe are you going to hang out tonight, or, or is, are you? I can hang out for a little bit. Yep, okay. I can hang out for a little bit. Rachel, hey, can I have a quick question? Sure. Can you uh, incorporate the parking lot in the scenario at all? Like, you know, some sports are more fast-paced, so you may do a little no sweat type thing, but yeah. And then what would you, so if you do interleave it, how would you do that? And if the coach, like, wants uh, an example, what would you say? Do you have a clipboard? Do you write it down? What are some? I usually say, yeah, that's a great question. And that's something when we talk about mistake ritual, um, I usually, I bring that up too a lot when I say, like, mistakes are okay. Because some coaches are like, wait, mistakes are not okay in my book. And I've had coaches challenge you, like, mental mistakes are not okay and physical, you know, those that kind of debate. So I always say when we're talking about a mistake ritual, we want them to, to forget it except for the part they learn from and sometimes it's important for an athlete to reset put it out of their mind it was just something that happened that was out of their control however if it's something that maybe they didn't give the best effort or maybe it was something you went over in practice yesterday that they didn't understand then we call it parking it put it on the bus I call it with my team and I will have it on a clipboard or I'll, I'll tell my, one of my assistant coaches a lot of times oh write that down remind me to tell her that and we just had this example tonight. My daughter just DQ'd in breaststroke of a swimming. She's only eight years old. And when she got out, I was like, oh, no, the coach is going to say, oh, sorry, honey, you just dis you were just disqualified. And she didn't. She said, remind me to tell Jane to practice tomorrow what she did differently, what she needs to do differently. And I thought that was a perfect example of parking a mistake because she still had three more events to swim, and breaststroke wasn't one of them, and that's the only stroke that she usually DQs in. And I thought, what a great example of parking a mistake, not messing her head up in the moment, but telling her about it tomorrow. So I thought that was I thought that was a good idea. Yep. Does that help? Okay. Rachel T. Yeah. Um, in regards to our um, question this week, can you explain to me how you would respond to a coach who asks you how to properly utilize the scoreboard? Okay, I what I say, and I've had people ask me that because sometimes they think, oh gosh, I'm not, not supposed to focus on the scoreboard at all. The scoreboard is a tool. It's one of the tools that we use to measure progress in a sport. And it's probably one of the best ways that we can keep it across the board as sort of an objective way to score a game and show progress. So I think valuing the scoreboard as a coach is important because the goal 
of any sport or any athletic event is to do better than the other team. And the way to measure that is through the scoreboard. However, if your focus is solely on the scoreboard, you're going to miss a lot of the effort that went into getting there. And because, and I always, I bring this up in workshops a lot too. How many of you have ever played a game and you have had the best game ever and your team has lost? And it happens a lot. Or vice versa. How many of you have played terribly and your teams end up winning the game and they're like, oh, Kelly, that was a great game. And you're like, really? Because I had a horrible game. So I think if you value, if you put all of your value on the scoreboard, you're going to miss out on some amazing learning opportunities and some amazing plays that have happened. However, if you put all of your emphasis on just the elm tree and just the mastery, the kids lose focus of why they're there. And that's important as well. So I think there is a very important balance of scoreboard focus and mastery focus. However, as coaches, I think we have to, just like we're, we're stressing the life lessons over the winning, it's the same thing with the scoreboard focus. How do you define success is really the question. How do you define winning? And the way that you define success as a team is part of your culture. And it's going to change the way you, you answer every question and you deal with every situation. So that's how I answer it. Um, I think for a while, uh, it's, it's, it's a fine line. And I've heard some trainers that I evaluate, and I've heard them say, you know, coaches, don't focus on the scoreboard. Only focus on mastery. And I think that's a trap as well. I think you have to be careful as coaches that you're fo you are the scoreboard is important. It's a tool. It's something that we use to measure progress. But if that's your only focus, that's where you get into trouble. Raul, question? Good? OK. Ruth, anything? Yeah, I have a question about the development zone, because you had sort of four buckets of people. Yep. Um, the leaders, parents, athletes, and coaches. Yep. Where do you put the off-field team of operations people and administrators that, that take care of all that stuff you need to actually get an athlete on the court, in the pool, on the field? Where I, do they put? I put them with leaders. Okay. Because when we do the leadership workshops, we actually, well, our leadership workshop is a smaller workshop, and we actually invite the um, athletic director, assistant athletic director, field coordinators, Anybody that's sort of an administrator to getting, as you said, to getting the, the game to actually happen, those are, that's the team that we invite to the leadership workshops. So that's where we would lump them. All right. Well, it's 9 o'clock. I'm not going to hold you any longer, but I will be on for a few more minutes. I can't stay too late tonight. I have my daughter texting me that she can't find her bathing suit. who just showed up at the swim meet, so I have to get that to her at some point within the next, <laughs> within the next 20 minutes, but I'll be on for a little bit if you guys have any questions. But the new, um, I'll put the links to both of these Hangouts on tomorrow. I'll send that to you tomorrow. And also, I will have the, um, the new questions for the week. So thank you, guys. I'll be on for a minute. Let me just answer this phone call real quick. And I will be right back with you, Owen, if you have a question. <laughs> All right, go ahead. I have a couple minutes. As, as a fellow swim parent, I, I feel your pain. Sorry, um, go ahead. I'll, I'll just email some of the other kind of cool stuff. This has been so invigorating, I have to say. Um, and then, you know, we're going through, we're in water polo season now, so we've been traveling with the, <clears throat> the boys to Montreal. And I was showing the slideshow um, to some folks who are also both the coaches and um, a lot of parent coaches who are now in their off season with water polo. Okay. And you alluded to this uh, in the last session, and I, I wanted to bring it up again, which was the fact that we lead with providing their personal information in an age where you know, number one, you're going to get spammed by PCA, and I, that's maybe a little bit harsh as a verb, but mm -hmm. and then. I'm sure that we, we have a policy where we don't farm out the emails of the list, right. but 
they're so easy to get to now that when I said, well, it might be every month or so, but I think there could be some really valuable stuff. It was a total turnoff in this, albeit small group. Yeah. But I had the same initial reaction myself, which is that as a, like as the lead slide, and I just you you mentioned it, so I, I just I just wanted to bring it up to you. Yeah. Well, you know, it's inter I don't know if you which call it was on, but we for years now by signing up for the text to sign in, they have only been given once a month. They were sent the PCA Momentum newsletter, and actually not even once a month. It came out quarterly. I don't know. Were you on that call when Katie was like, "Actually, you're wrong. It comes out more." So I'm not really sure how I feel about that exactly right now. Um, it was through market research that we've decided to add that in. Yep. So the interesting thing for me is knowing why they did it, but I get more feedback from people like worried about giving me their email address because they don't want to be hit with a lot of things. So I've always felt pretty confident saying, you know, four times a year comes out quarterly. That to me wasn't very invasive. People are like, oh, okay, that's great. And then everything else you could sign up for so as I said, somehow I'm not in the marketing department. Somehow the marketing department literally over the last week or so decided that they're going to be getting more now. Um, so I will be back from San, San Francisco next week because <laughs> I'm sure we're going to talk about the changes and find out what's going on with that. But okay. yeah, I, I yeah. was interested because you brought it up and I, I do think it's uh, it, I'll be interested to see what, what you guys conclude because I think it might be it, like this. The stuff is so good. Yeah. So many great slides that I, my opinion is that if you, if you backloaded it, then it could be a pull, not a push. Right. Um, but because I think otherwise you're going to get some fake emails. Anyway, thanks a lot. For yeah. The no, I agree. I agree. I'll I'll uh, I'll put that opinion out there. Okay. See what we come All up right. with. All right. Thanks, Owen. Bye.